Welcome to Colorectal Cancers Ready for the Next Round. My name is Anne-Marie Wright, and I'm privileged to be the host and moderator of this uh, critically important initiative. The mission of the initiative is clear, to raise awareness of the importance of uninterrupted colorectal cancer screening and treatment, and to find strategies for strengthening health system resilience. This is the third of four thought leadership roundtables each representing uh, the views of four different stakeholder groups that Colorectal Cancer Canada has been hosting. We want to hear firsthand experiences from patients, physicians, healthcare system leaders, and researchers to identify new solutions and ideas for colorectal cancer care across the system. On behalf of Colorectal Cancer Canada, I would like to thank the amazing sponsors of this initiative. We're grateful to Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Immelheim, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Merck, Novartis, and Pendofarm. And a very large thank you to the participants today. We'll do our introductions uh, to, to the group in a moment. Quick couple of housekeeping notes. Um, this session is being recorded. There is a report writer who will be capturing uh, the essence of uh, this very comprehensive discussion. And secondly, um, particularly for our panelists, there is a small audience who is sitting behind on a webinar. And the reason they're there is, of course, they're very interested in what you have to, to hear. Unfortunately, we will not be taking questions from that audience. Instead, what we want to do is encourage any of our audience members, if they do have comments or questions following this session, to add their input uh, to the following uh, E address, which I'm going to read twice for you. Join the conversation at colorectalcancer.com. Join the join the convert, pardon me, join the conversation, all one word, at colorectalcancer.com. Uh, alternatively, Maria, who most of you have met uh, as you received your invitations from her, would be more than happy to help you. Um, having said that, I do want to encourage. Kevin, Fred, and Tim, and David, when he joins, feel free to ask questions of each other. I don't have to be the only one asking questions. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to interact as a group as well. So what are we aiming to do with Ready for the Next Round? What are the goals of this? Um, we'd like to play a very short video. Um, our friend Tim is featured in that video that sets the stage for today's conversation. The best chance to beat cancer is to treat the patient when they're at the early stage of disease. You want to get it early and you want to treat it early. So when COVID hit, cancer screening was interrupted. Because of the interruptions on these screening programs, people will miss their chance for an early diagnosis. They'll find out they have cancer when it's already progressed to a later stage. Amongst my patients, there have been longer than usual waits to get a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, and that means a, a longer time than usual to get the appropriate evaluation and the treatments that they need. It's extremely important for the healthcare system to be ready to deal with the next crisis. We need to be innovative, collaborative. We will need streamlined solutions with new technologies to be more efficient. Collaboration is going to be key. We all have to work together to get past this and get past the next crisis that's sure to come. Our preparation needs to begin right now. So simply stated, COVID delayed the fight against cancer. We need to be ready for the next crisis. Being ready is not about bouncing back to the pre-Canadian system, but evolving into something better and stronger. 
The goal must be to build a sustainable system that is able to respond to future system shocks, be prepared for longer term planning and undertake positive actions, taking into account the benefits and risks of both the general population and patients. Today, colorectal cancer has assembled, as you'll see, an expert round table of health system stakeholders. Uh, I uh, want to mention that one of our uh, stakeholders, uh, Pamela Frolic, who is president and CEO of, of um, Innovative Medicines Canada, had wished to join us today. She cannot. We do have some video comments from Pamela, which we're going to weave into this conversation at the end. I think it's beneficial to this group. Her comments are um, uh, very insightful, and I think everybody would see tremendous value of that. So I am going to kick this session off. And first and foremost, perhaps I'm going to welcome David Armstrong, who's somewhere in the woods, clearly, although it's dusk wherever he is. And so, David, I'd ask you, please, to briefly introduce yourself to the group. Thank you very much indeed, and my apologies for the late arrival. Um, this has been a day of successive uh, Zoom meetings, uh, some of which are a little shorter than others. Um, so I'm I'm a gastroenterologist at, in Hamilton at Hamilton Health Sciences and uh, prof of gastroenterology or medicine at uh, McMaster University. Um, I'm past president of the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology, and through that was involved in quality indicators and wait times for gastroenterology for endoscopy and uh, chairing the National Colon Cancer Screening Network as an expert advisor on colorectal cancer screening for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. Thank you, David, very much. Fred, may I go to you now? Yes, thank, thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, my name is Fred Horn. I'm a health policy consultant. Uh, I've worked in health policy in Canada for almost, well, over 35 years now. And, uh, both in government and in the not-for-profit and, and private sectors. Um, I am a former Minister of Health uh, from Alberta and um, you know, largely got out into uh, politics out of frustration really over um, inaction in, in healthcare in critical areas like the one we're gonna talk about today. So uh, in addition to my, uh, my consulting work, I chair the board of Mohawk Medby Corporation, which is, uh, uh, one of the largest uh, supply chain management organizations in, in healthcare in Canada. And today I'm speaking to you from um, uh, Comox, British Columbia. Uh, I'm on the board of Providence Living, which is uh, an affiliated uh, organization with Providence Healthcare in BC. And uh, uh, right now we're here um, just about to begin the construction of Canada's first publicly funded dementia village uh, here on Vancouver Island. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Fred, and uh, you, you and I can connect later. My brother-in-law is involved in that project. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. yes, yeah. Kevin, may we go to you next? Hi, I, Kevin Wilson. I'm uh, vice president of population health uh, quality and research at the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency. Uh, so, my portfolio includes the screening programs and including the colorectal uh, screening program. Thank you. And uh, Tim. Hi, my name's Tim Hanna. I am a radiation oncologist and work in Kingston, Ontario. I'm a health services researcher at Queen's University Division of Cancer Care and Epidemiology. And um, I use a lot of administrative data in my work uh, and over the course of, of COVID, my questions on access to care, quality of care, and, and outcomes um, investigated the impact of treatment delay on mortality. Um, and um, that was a, a topic that uh, I've been speaking with the media a, a, fair, a fair bit about, and certainly this whole topic of uh, Im improving and, and coming back in a different and better way as a cancer control system in Canada, certainly on my heart. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. And thank you again for participating in the video as well. Your comments, um, I, I know are valued by many. I think that's a great bridge into the conversation that we're going to have over the next two hours. Um, this is meant to be very interactive. As I said, it would be great if you have questions of each other. 
Um, please don't let me get in your way of asking those questions as well. Um, I, we're gonna start fairly broadly. And I know that all of you have been speaking fairly extensively on the subject of resilient healthcare systems, impact on cancer care related to the system. So uh, all of you have gained just tremendous amount of knowledge. So to set the stage today, what I wanted to open with was, was, was a question that essentially was, while there is a lot of literature on the impact of cancer, uh, of the pandemic on cancer care, um, can you set the stage for us on what you think those big impacts were, particularly across the continuum if we look at prevention versus diagnosis versus treatment versus survivorship? So perhaps, Tim, I'll start with you because you have collected so much data in this space. Yeah. So I, I, I have to say that um, a, lot, a lot of my, my research uh, was meta-analysis using, using pre-existing data because we had such trouble getting our hands on the data um, from the first six to 12 months of the pandemic. And I think that's a theme that maybe we'll come back to, the importance of having real-time access to, to data. Uh, but certainly what I've seen in anecdotes and news stories and, uh, and from the data that I've been able to lay my hands on, um, that there were large drops in the diagnosis of, of cancer, not just colorectal cancer, but uh, many cancers across the board um, in many provinces and, and internationally as well. And, and typically it seems that that drop um, in uh, back in 2020, it was in the range of 15 to, to 30%. And uh, I treat skin cancer and knowing about that, I know that we've seen big drops in Ontario and there's been recovery, but uh, the, the backlog of, di of case diagnoses um, is so large that I, I don't think we fully recovered from it. And when, when we haven't diagnosed those cases yet, there's the, a big concern that um, we're going to be falling behind in um, timely diagnosis leading to stage shift and more advanced stage presentations. I've anecdotally seen that myself and some of the, the data that's emerging internationally suggests that. And, and what that means is, is um, impacts on the complexity of treatments, the cost of overall treatment, um, and, and of course, ultimately um, changes in long-term outcomes, which you can't measure directly yet. But the, but the available data would certainly suggest that um, we can expect impacts on outcomes such as survival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. I think you, you've presented a number of different launching points uh, on how we can look at impact across the continuum, but I'm going to go next to uh, Kevin to uh, help us set the stage from your perspective. Uh, sure, so I would, you know, similar to what uh, Tim, indicated uh, we certainly did see a drop in uh, referrals even to the agency so and I think it would be a, a comparable pattern that we saw in other jurisdictions one of the you know challenges certainly for example in the uh, prevention front is we had uh, a northern bus it was a mobile unit that would go to northern communities and we haven't been able to use that for the last couple of years just given the issues around COVID with that so we would have used that on the um, in the screening realm to try to encourage uh, uptake uh, in some of those uh, outlying communities. So we've lost lost that, and we certainly did. You know, with uh, the closing screening for a period of about a couple months to redeploy people to help in other areas, and just until we had a safe environment for clients to come come into, created uh, some backlogs there. And uh, you know, fortunately, we we're moving through those, but. Um, at some point, I'd be interested, Tim, to understand better uh, as far as how we can. We, we had tried to look at stage shift and haven't been able to, to do that. We've had some challenges doing that with the data, but it'd be interesting to know how you would see approaching that. Great. Thank you. We'll make note of that and come back to that. David, could we bridge to you? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I, I don't... I guess to some extent, like uh, like like Kevin and Timothy, I don't have access to real time data. Um, what I have is, if you like, more anecdotal um, on the ground from a clinical point of view, which is participation in colorectal cancer screening uh, from a colonoscopy point of view or following up with screening. 
And we certainly saw huge drop-offs in part because screening was suspended during the early part of COVID as it was in some of the other provinces as well. Mm-hmm. Um, in part because once that happens, it goes off people's radar. So it's difficult to get them back up, you know, get people back into the system again. And it really speaks, I think, to a disruption of a system uh, that that was sort of functioning before, but once it disrupts, it's not, it's it's like I've said about playing you, Kaplunk. You can take bits out of Kaplunk, but when it collapses, you can't put a stick back in and, and hope that it's going to reconstitute itself. And so, um, you know, we still have many patients who are not really sure whether they should or should not be testing. They have concerns. And all of this is feeding into either delay diagnosis or potentially stage shift and the backlog of people who are going to be coming up and need to do screening. And I think the other thing that we're seeing is that, you know, those who are particularly challenged in terms of following through are those who are already um, sort of disadvantaged or underserviced. So the, you know, the lower socioeconomic um, classes, the, the groups, those who are disadvantaged for other reasons, aren't feeding back into the system. And so when you talked about, you know, this is not just about resetting the system, what we have is there's a real danger that if we decide to ramp up again, that we'll go after the low hanging fruit as it were, and we're gonna to go to the people who are easily communicable with, and the people who are already disadvantaged will become further disadvantaged because in our laudable goal to get up to speed, we're going to go where the money is. And, and that then leads to greater disparity and disadvantage within the system as well. The other point I want to make about this is that although it's really important to talk about this as cancer care, this is part of an overall system. And I see that particularly, I think, as part of, you know, as a gastroenterologist for whom colorectal cancer screening is important, but it's actually not the bulk of our endoscopic work. It does, however, take priority from a system point of view at times as does colorectal cancer surgery. And so, but I have on my books patients who've been waiting a year, 18 months for surgery for inflammatory bowel disease that's been held up. And they will take a lower priority than people with colorectal cancer. And again, I'm not arguing with that, but it's it's a system which is now, was sort of, was as it were running, our hospitals were running at 110% to 120% occupancy before COVID hit. And, and to, to, to ramp back up again to that and to accommodate some of the increases reads not just resilience within the cancer care system, which is going to be really important. It actually needs a, re- a re-engineering or review of the framework within which that sits. Um, and, you know, there are, there, are whole, there are a whole slew of things, as I'm sure you know. We, we, our endoscopy nurses were redeployed. So although we're now opening up, we actually don't have endoscopy nurses. And if we have another wave, they're going to get redeployed and they're going to decide. Some decided they were going to go off and start families or they were going to work somewhere else or they didn't want to work in an endoscopy unit. So even though the resources are there and we're told we can start doing things again, we actually don't have anybody don't have them. to do it. And mm-hmm. so the, the, this, is, the, this is a key part. You know, what we're talking about here is really key. But engineering that without reference to the rest of the system, to the people who are already uh, underserved or disadvantaged and to the need to provide care to people and those with complications from COVID is, is, is going to be really difficult. And, and it speaks, I think, to the need to engage with other groups uh, who have been hit by the COVID pandemic and are also now coming to the realization that you know running things at 100 percent you can get away with it if everything is aligned but once you get a hurricane or a covid or something else like that then the wheels fall off yeah yeah kaplunk um thank you i want to come back and talk about uh get your uh opinion on um disadvantage groups diversity and some of the uh i think more specialized uh impacts there but Fred let's first go to you well well, thank you I mean um, I obviously I'm not going to be able to offer you know a clinical perspective on this but um, I think uh, David's comments in particular sort of invite um, a look at um, you know system-wide implications or broader health policy implications 
uh, and, and it's certainly not just in the area of cancer. Um, uh, I think we could look at a variety of chronic diseases and be equally concerned um, around, you know, uh, what, what the ramifications of COVID are for essentially losing people uh, and, or, and the other, the added cost of not, not continuing to identify new people who we should be reaching out to, particularly in, um, you know, in the lower, lower socioeconomic demographic, but overall. Um, so a couple of thoughts. The, the first one is, um, you know, in addition to looking at um, bringing, bringing the so-called system, and I, and I say that deliberately back up to speed, uh, to capacity, um, and, you know, tackling this question of where, where was the breathing room, what breathing room should be built in um, around this, you know, in, in terms of running at 100%. Uh, I'm really concerned about what is the cost to population health outcomes? What, what are the, or another way, uh, what are the gains that were being made under uh, many of the innovative approaches to, you know, to screening and, and treatment pre-COVID? Um, we need to account for those, um, those losses, uh, both in capacity and in, and in terms of patient outcomes. We need to be counting that as carefully as we are counting the number of uh, you know, screenings that we're up to as of last month and what we're planning for next year. Uh, and you know, I say that knowing that's a more complicated process and you know, back to the point about data and access to data, we don't have um, you know, real-time data to, to turn to. Um, but I think we have to think about that because once we've, once we've measured it, I'm pretty sure that we'll come to the conclusion that simply restoring levels of, of screening and treatment uh, to what they were pre-COVID is not going to be enough to recoup those gains and to make uh, further gains in the future. We are going to need additional capacity. So um, it, it, it's... And I think cancer is, you know, is, is a good example because it affects so many Canadians, but we're going to need to enhance capacity uh, in an attempt, not just to catch up, but to regain whatever those population health uh, outcome uh, benefits were that we have lost, or we're going to end up losing, we're going to end up losing a generation of Canadians potentially uh, unnecessarily. So I'm not sure how articulate I've been at trying to, uh, trying to explain that, but um it goes beyond the bricks and mortar of the uh, of the acute care system and treatment. It actually goes to um, you know protecting those health gains, which uh, which are significant in some yeah. some parts of the country. Fred, you're magnificently articulate. So um, I do want to dig in on the issue of capacity a little bit because it was a very interesting conversation with oncologists, physicians last night. They said we're already at 150 percent. Uh, David, you said the system was already at 110%. So how is it possible that you catch up when you're already over capacity with resource pressures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So it's, uh, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, so, I mean, there, there are a couple of things which, and I think it may be that what we need is, is to take a step back and make sure that we've got all of our baseline assumptions are appropriate. And, and so the, why do I say that? One of the things is that CPAC and Health Canada did some modeling around how to ramp up and what would be needed to play catch up for colorectal cancer screening, for example. And, I, and I, so I'm picking a particular area. And the argument was that we need to, that we might need to delay some people getting their routine screening so that we could bring in those who have missed and how much do you have to delay to get everybody on board and how long does it take based on current capacity. And so the assumption was that we need to do something because our capacity is limited. And, and that's true if you say that our capacity last year is actually ceiling. But the, the point about that is our capacity, if you take our hospital, for example, is that we run endoscopy from nine to 12 and one to four, five days a week. We do not do anything at weekends. We don't do evenings. We used to do evenings, but that was not, was, was not uh, desperately popular with some staff and it cost a little more. Um, 
but th there's actually capacity. And so we have MRI scanners or CT scanners that seem to be running 24-7. Mm -hmm. And we have an endoscopy unit that arguably runs, I've got to work this one out, but it's, it's, it's 30 hours out of 168. So last year's capacity is, is historical, but if we really want to do things, then maybe there are ways of re-engineering what we do so that we can actually bring people in. If we do weekends instead of trying to bring everybody in at the week, then we may actually get people who've got relatives who can bring them in and take them home when they can't afford to take time off work. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it requires, I think, and I suspect there are other areas where we need to say, not just what's our historical capacity, but what do we, what, where, where, are the, where are the opportunities for innovation in trying to deal with this? And what's, that's the first thing, is the short term. And then the long term is to, I think to Fred's point is, if we can do that in the short term, were our previous models really the optimal model or are they there just because that's what we've done for the last 10 years? And is this not now time to say, are there better ways of using our resources to deliver on the goals that we have rather than continuing to do what we did before? Yeah. If I could just say, Marie, um, I, I think that's, that's an excellent point. It, it's actually the nub of it in many ways. Um, all healthcare um, decisions, uh, resource allocation decisions are by definition opportunity cost decisions. Um, uh, do we, you know, do we have an understanding for the system as it stood before COVID um, of what we were foregoing in terms of better opportunities to achieve the same or better outcomes for patients? I don't think we can say that really in any area of healthcare because I don't think we, we budget and make decisions that way. Um, you know, if you're running a, a, a Ministry of Health budget, you're largely dealing with a, a, a standard set of programs and services that you know, some, will, some of those programs will have roots going back 10 and 20 years. Um, the only question that comes up each year is, you know, are, if we're going to get a 1% or a 2% increase, but we're investing it in doing the same, doing things the same way as we've always done them. I think cancer is somewhat of an exception because of, you know, in, in some parts of the country, the high level of integration be, between research and education and clinical activities. But it, it's fundamental to this, not to stop at the question of what was the impact of COVID, COVID on managing um, uh, demand, right? And really thinking through, um, was, was the system optimal before? And where are we going to redirect uh, resources, uh, you know, that were uh, in place pre-COVID? Um, to me, that's, uh, that's a bigger part of the, the the story here. Yeah, and I'd like to explore that a little bit, Fred. First, I'd like to go to Kevin, who's got his hand up. Please. Sure. No, I think um, as far as improvements, uh, you know, there's some, I think, some specific pieces relative to endoscopy that uh, I think we, we have learned, or try to learn from others, but we don't have a provincial um, scheduling for all of endoscopy in the province, for example, right? So we've started to do uh, uh, some work with CPAC actually has been assisting to look at coming up with a provincial approach to try to better utilize those resources. And I think that's even pre and post COVID provides us with uh, more opportunity. And similarly, unfortunately, we don't have full navigation across the province. So um, we have definitely done a little bit or done some analysis to show that patients who do receive uh, navigation uh, get to endoscopy faster and uh, in a less stressful way. So there are definitely areas for improvements even within the systems we currently have. Yeah, thank you so much. Tim, anything you'd like to weigh in on here? Um, yeah, I, 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 when I think it's a re really interesting thinking about you know, simple concepts like increasing the number of operating hours to um, take advantage of um, you know resources that are that are already there, um, I I think kind of um, uh, parallel to that is is human capacity, and um, you know during COVID we heard all about you know the need for more ICU beds, but of course it wasn't the bed. That was the issue, yeah. but all the staff that were needed for each of those beds. And I think there are many, many areas in, in healthcare where it's 
It's um, the human resources to do the job that um, lim limits timely access to treatment and can uh, lead to waiting times. Um, and, I, and I do wonder if, you know, thinking on to the theme about resilience and adaptability, if having a more diverse uh, population of healthcare providers with more diverse positions uh, would allow both increasing human capacity, but also um, um, expanding to uh, be more inclusive in, in the sorts of positions that more, more a wider range of individuals um, would be satisfied with, part-time positions, uh, clinician scientist positions, um, more, more uh, t teaching clinician positions, for, for example, uh, among uh, physicians, uh, because those, those um, can scale the amount of, of, uh, of clinical work that a person could do. So for, for example, thinking of myself when COVID hit, um, I, I, I could have offered a, a lot more um, clinical work um, and cut down on my research if needed um, to deal with a, with a surge. Um, so I, 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 do, I do wonder about, you know, some of that, those fundamental things like simply training um, more people in certain areas. I know not every area that's the issue, but. Yeah, I'd like to build on that and tie it back into uh, something that you said, Fred and Gade, we had a, a, a really robust conversation with a group of oncologists last night and a ver very strong recurring theme was burnout. Not just at their level, but nurses, um, it, 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 and, and, and their view was fun, was almost how are we going to deal with the capacity from a resource perspective? People are leaving the system. The system needs to develop more flexibility around bringing people who perhaps retired back in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this became a very real part of the discussion was burnout, stress management, mental health issues almost bigger than the um, ability to do the work period. Thoughts on that? <laughs> I agree. Yes. I, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely, and, and that, that's one of the issues really with people re being redeployed. I think Tim's point about training people appropriately. Um, and again, I pick, pick the areas where I, I have sort of straightforward experience, but you know, we, we have senior nurses as endoscopy nurses in the endoscopy room who are wonderful, but truth be told, are not doing much nursing. And they're spending a lot of time doing data entry. Um, and, you know, hospitals, a number of hospitals have taken this opportunity to introduce electronic health records in the midst mm -hmm. of a pandemic at a time. So, you know, I have two hours every, or I, probably two hours every week now where I'm seconded to an endoscopy reporting committee for 15 months. Um, and so, yes, they need to be done. Are they necessarily, is this the time to do it? And should this really be looking at the model for endoscopy service where you have a nurse and maybe a nurse assistant or somebody to transcribe, or maybe we don't need to record reams of electronic data that go into a repository where nobody will ever see them again. Um, so that there are a number of things in here and this comes back to system, but I, again, you know, sometimes when things break, that's the time to say, not just yeah. do we band-aid it, but can we take a step back and say, what really do we need? And yeah. burnout is going to be huge. So I think there's a number of people who are just going to walk away are going to do, you know, career changes. We've certainly seen it in, in, in nursing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there a starting place, David, that you would like to, um, suggest because if we look at this as a greenfield exercise uh, a chance to rebuild is there a place that you would go first um so I, I haven't really reviewed across the system what the what the issues are um I mean, if I look at it, I, I guess the start to this is screening, really, isn't it? If we're looking at it from a colorectal cancer's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of this may then be to say, how is, is there a way to open up colorectal cancer, the, the colonoscopy part? So they actually know to do the screening in such a way that it's, it, it's linked directly through to colonoscopy with rapid access, incorporating for many jurisdictions, 
uh, what Kevin talked about, about having navigators, which, for example, we don't generally have in Ontario. And so revamping the way that we actually reach out to people, increase the likelihood that they're actually going to respond, do their test, and we sort of lead them by the hand through Mm -hmm. the procedure to do colonoscopy because we have high cancellation rates which is an enormous waste of resources um and then say right if we're going to do this can we do these recognizing there's going to be an extra cost perhaps in the short term but where do we 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 um as it were solidify a management navigation process that then can be rolled out and scaled to other areas so this is not saying to provinces or programs you have to revamp everything you do, but brainstorming around what are potential solutions, testing them in a nimble way, rather like any, you know, it's like lean business development. Right. Work out right. where you need to pivot, well where you need to make the differences, and then say, right, we've got something now that can be scaled, that can be moved on somewhere else and somewhere else. So it's Thank it's you. really it's it's it it's being yeah, I think it's being innovative on a small scale with a view to 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 enlarging and rolling out rather than trying to look at engineering from the top down a whole of a system to deal with a problem and yeah. and that 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 may be yeah. that that's my thought around that yeah. Red. Could, yeah if i could jump in on that i think that's it's so interesting to look at other um other specialties um and, you know for those sorts of examples so i'm thinking uh in my case i'm thinking of um arthroplasty in alberta um uh hip and knee replacement where we had um it wasn't the issue wasn't so much cancellation but but we did know that there were numerous people waiting unnecessarily to see um orthopedic specialists uh that could have been um screened out actually at the primary care level in the system so what what we did was send up three separate uh centralized assessment clinics uh, in the province, we used uh, multidisciplinary teams, and and the theory was that everyone who's involved should practice as close to the top of their scope of practice as possible. So nurses, for example, were trained in how to recognize hairline fractures. Um, you know, uh, physiotherapists and 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 other staff were involved um, uh, in the assessment process, and and the the end result was through this centralized process which didn't stop at screening but it included all of the other things that you know used to be separate transactions as part of the same process uh, resulted in about eight of ten people being taken out of the queue to see an orthopedic specialist usually be yeah usually because they were found to have you know um, um an, an, another issue, lower back pain issue, uh, for example, that could be managed in a different way. And I, I don't want to oversimplify certainly something like cancer. Um, but I use it as an example, because it was not only, uh, you know, it didn't result in a cost plus opportunity, and nor did it result in a cash savings. But what it did was it freed up um, higher more uh, higher, uh, more complex, more sophisticated, more scarce resources um, that could then be redeployed for people at it, you know, at a, at advanced stages of um, of their condition where they required that level of intervention, and that was, you know, it had a lot to do, with, obviously, with the leadership and cooperation of physicians and nurses, but it also had a lot to do with repositioning this activity at the level of primary care in in our healthcare system yeah. uh you know the 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 more open more accessible sort of uh unreserved thing be, beyond the walls of the hospital so i don't know if that has any uh hope or analogy in terms of um of the question that we're discussing today but it was instructive to me um uh you know, I, uh, David's raised his hand, but uh, I wanted to say, Fred, I think that's exactly the kind of um, uh, more transformative, interesting, I'll use the word pilots, that were very informing, very insightful, that can be used to as bridges for change, because it was a very ground up um, initiative that had clearly good results. And uh, during your time as minister, there was a number of those. So I, I would encourage you to bring those ideas forward as we further this conversation. David? Yeah, so I, I think they're, they're, they're excellent points. And I, and I wanted to sort of mm -hmm. just to sort of reinforce those with other examples, which are perhaps more germane right. directly to this, which is 
For example, the gastroenterology group in Quebec City had this huge wait list of people when they were trying to work out how to incorporate colorectal cancer screening. And what they did was they basically sat down with their entire wait list of people waiting for colonoscopy, re-triaged them, contacted the patients, and, and basically got rid of most of their wait list. And the Newfoundland Very program as well uh, did the same thing. They had all of these people who were nominally waiting for colonoscopy, and they basically picked up the phone and they went, okay, when was your last screening test? What was it doing? Do you really want to come in for a colonoscopy? And an amazing number of people said, no, thank you. Happy to do fit test, leave me alone. And then, then I'll come in if I need to. And in fact, from Calgary, uh, and we were talking about this the other day, I and mean, we, we had, I had a talk from, we had a talk from Mark Swain, who's chief of GI in, in Calgary, and they've done the sort of clinical assessment pathways for gastroenterology. So again, they had long wait lists, not directly necessarily in the colorectal cancer space, but a lot of people waiting to be seen. And what they did was to work with primary care and say, right, for these indications, these are management strategies you can implement without you having to send the patient on to us. You, we will endorse you following these pathways. And what they did was to cut hugely the number of people who were waiting to be seen for specialist care. Yeah, and again, the, these are part of expanding outside of the of the direct colorectal cancer screening. But what it does is it frees up uh, some of the resources, as somebody said, to for those where you actually need either GI input, surgical input, or endoscopist input, and, and working with primary care so that the system works better. But that needs support. And you know, I was talking to our endoscopy unit manager because she was on this talk from Mark Swain. And you know, we, we've tried this and, and you know, actually had meetings with our local family practitioners over the last 10 years. And and I, I you know, I would argue that one of the differences was that the Ministry of Health in, in Alberta was actually open to the idea of supporting this initiative in Calgary, which allowed it to get off the ground. Um, and so it, it's again having a system that recognizes where there is an opportunity to run pilot studies and then working with local groups who can implement and test and then pivot and, and allow them to be scaled up. Thank you, David. That was an outstanding example. You know, building on what Fred said, Tim, Kevin, any examples from your perspectives that you think are worth sharing on interesting, uh, innovative, but I'll call it grassroots um, initiatives that um, have demonstrated the potential for positive outcome. I, you know, I think our probably the most tangible example would be uh, the navigation and a comparison between where we have navigation and where we don't have navigation. Yeah. And there's clear, um, clearly better, um, much better uh, timelines to get to endoscopy and follow through than where we have navigation versus where we don't. So that would probably be the, be the most practical. We would have interest. Um, I think everyone's concerned about that prime that the primary healthcare interface as to how you, whether it's rapid diagnostic centers or something like that, but we haven't done that, but have talked about the potential for that. Yeah, Kevin, just building on that as a, as a, as a reinforcement of that idea, that again, the oncologist last night yeah, um, had, had, had high appetite for navigation, cancer coaches, somebody who could actually guide and talk somebody through the system. They saw huge, huge efficiencies in that. So it's a great idea. David, your hand is up. So I, I'm happy to let Tim go first. I just wanted to remind myself I was going to say something in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Tim, would you like oh, to go first? David, go ahead. I, I don't have anything to add right now. Okay. So I, I was just going to add in, and, and this is, I think, is part of engineering at the start. One of the things we've talked about is the lack of real-time data to understand what's happening in the systems. So I think the other part in designing, if one's designing grassroots systems is to say, not just does it work, but where are the data that we need to collect to monitor this, which will work internally to track whether or not the project is, is functioning, but could also be a template for how other centers as they come on board, if you've got a successful pilot, will continue to collect data and provide real-time data. Because again, it's about working out how to collect data that are useful at the time, rather than trying to re-engineer databases and do post hoc data analysis for things that are, where data is coming through three, six, nine, 12 months after the fact. Yeah. Um, Fred, I see your hand. Uh, Tim, this is your area of specialty. 
So I would really love you to weigh in here. Yeah, no, I, I think the idea of um, better data is, is so appealing um, and it allows us to make decisions when we're, we're struck with something out of the blue, like, well, not completely out of the blue, like when COVID hit, but certainly when uh, something hits the system and we need to know uh, answers fast. Um, you know, many of the um, the data sources we collect, the administrative data sources we collect, for example, in Ontario, are are amazing and very high quality. Um, uh, we we did a study where we compared the economic analysis we could do with the Ontario administrative data to what um, uh, clinical trial investigators could do with hand collected data for for their trial patients. And when we linked in the clinical trial data to um, ICES, the Administrative Data Repository in Ontario, we found that the, the admin data um, performed better. Um, but the, the problem is that the lag in access to that information um, and, and the, the time it takes to, to clean that data up. So, um, I mean, there, there are many uh, themes. I mean, the, the theme of, of data standardization, a, a minimum data set, um, breaking down silos between provinces, um, ha having um, uh, clear linkages between data sources, I, I, I think that, that that would be um, me meaningful and important and can drive a, a lot of uh, useful change and, and projects of any scale, whether you're talking at a single institution or, or a region or uh, something larger. So Tim, I've had the pleasure of reading some of your work and um, the subject of data and many of the issues that you've highlighted, federalization of data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are, topics have been around for a while. And uh, the question then becomes, has the pandemic created the uh, lightning rod for change? Is, there, is this the time to actually get this done? Well, I'll be interested to hear from the others. I, I mean, I, I think the proof will be in the pudding. Um, I, I think that, that it's certainly, um, it's been a, a stimulus. And then I think uh, along the, the same uh, trajectory is the interest in precision medicine, thinking of oncology and, and the, the need to have real world data um, and, and data that we have access to quickly and data that's big data and probably covers multiple uh, provinces and regions. So. Right. So perhaps there's a bit of a convergence going on. Yeah, and before I let you let you off and move off to on to uh, David, who also has his hand up, is um, um, is there something more specific around data in the cancer space that you would you know back to that question of how do you get this? It, it's an amorphous amount of work. How do, how do you how can we start uh, with with even even um, a, a, a consistent federalized database for cancer in this country? I, I think demonstration projects of different levels are important. Um, and and that's, that's starting to emerge for, for oncology, um, uh, sh showing that, um, that collecting this data and using it can result in uh, direct uh, benefits to patients, you know, thinking about precision medicine, um, demonstrating that uh, having this real world data al allows us to better evaluate the, the value of, of uh, many new precision drugs um, and, and that we can only do this when, we're, when we uh, come together and, and have data that is um, interoperable across regions. I think that that's, um, that's, that's powerful. And then I, I think on the, I think the other side of just health services research, um, you know, for example, having uh, dashboards uh, for, for different elements of, of cancer care and control and, and um, evaluating the uh, utility of, of that. Um, yeah, I would like to come back to both the, the dashboard issue as well as uh, further discussion on data. I'll, um, Fred, you had your hand up a moment ago and then David, I'll go to you. Sorry, I just, um, this is a bit of a lightning rod for me, the discussion about data, because um, uh, at, a, at a health system level, um, you know, we tend to talk about this as if it's innovative work, uh, breaking new ground. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that we, you know, we lag uh, other OECD countries and, you know, we'll often use the federated uh, 
model in Canada as uh, a, a reason or as an excuse or you know unique differences uh, for for not moving forward. But this is an area that needs immediate leadership. And it's not as if we haven't spent money on this problem, right? Uh, right. If you look at uh, uh, Canada Health, the investments in Canada Health Infoway, and even in my own province in Alberta, you know, not hard to get to $1.8 billion if you go all the way back to some of the first uh, electronic medical record applications that were, that were publicly funded and developed. The common thing about a lot of them, in, in, in my view, is that they are designed to automate old ways of doing things. They are not designed as they need to be to enable new models of care. And I think that's part of what holds it, holds it back. If you're, you know, if, if your lens as a decision maker is in investing, and these are substantial, you know, sums that we're talking about in, in simply moving people from, you know, paper to, uh, uh, to a tablet or, or to a computer, you're probably not going to rank that. Uh, you know, high in priority. But if you're talking about the use of real-time data in an integrated fashion, um, uh, and, and particularly with what uh, Tim said about um, just <laughs> the, the, the wealth of potential in administrative data alone, uh, I mean, that is a much more exciting, that is a revolutionary proposition. And the time for that, you know, was decades ago in Canada. I, I'm of the view that it doesn't have to take... Um, a whole lot to get that going. Um, uh, if we took the view in the healthcare system uh, that data was not a, you know, not, uh, and IMIT wasn't about the back office, that it was actually, um, uh, it was actually infrastructure, critical infrastructure uh, that's required. And we put that in place, we could, we could do a lot more than, um, you know, address, and it's a very important question, address the current uh, capacity issues in the system, we could move to, uh, you know, more of a value-based healthcare model. And, you know, for those that, that are familiar with it, I'm, I'm talking, there's different versions. I'm talking about sort of the original Michael Porter, Elizabeth Tysdale model where, uh, you know, you design your health system to fund uh, a particular outcome at a, at a particular standard. Um, you don't design it only to pay for the inputs you know, regardless of what that outcome is going to be. I, I love the potential of um, the cancer treatment area to provide leadership um, in building a more value-based approach to how we deliver care. But you, I, and I think from what little I know, I mean, cancer has it over many other areas in terms of uh, standardized outcomes. Um, cancer has it in terms of having identified you know, the, what the critical data is uh, that, that you need access to. And it's up to the rest of the system to provide that, you know, as I'll call it, critical infrastructure so that that can be done. Um, I, I appreciate what you're saying about pilot projects, Tim, and, and, you know, no doubt some of those would be important. But a lot of the people, uh, you know, that I talk to know, we know how to do this. We know how to build that infrastructure. A lot of times it's debates over, uh, you know, perceived barriers in, in, in legislation, whether we're talking about privacy legislation, or I stopped listening to that when I became minister. I'm, I'm not saying I didn't take legal advice, but on this question of, you know, people, citizens don't want it. They're, they, they don't want us sharing their information. They're, you know, they're protective of it quite on, on the contrary, you know, they, they assume that we are sharing it among the appropriate uh, providers and researchers to deliver better care. So, sorry, I, I, I warned you. <laughs> uh, I'll, no, no, I'll we, uh, and, and it's very valuable. I do wanna ask you one question before we bridge to the next thing is, there might be a chicken or egg. Do we need to establish new models of care first before we get onto the data side of it? Or how does, how, what, what is the dance around that? My perspective, it, it's, it's getting the, the infrastructure, the support system in place that, that allows for the data, you know, for the repositories and, and the access. And it's a, I'm not a clinician, but I would imagine it's a continuous uh, loop where you're, you're continually refining and, um, you know, uh, your outcomes, whatever they may be in a particular area, but you're, you're doing it not just on the basis of what articles are being published, you're doing on the basis of the real world data that's coming in 
not just from your system, but from other provinces and other countries. I mean, we, we should be able to be a leader in, in this globally, I would think. Great. Can David, I, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow on because I think that's, that's incredibly relevant. And, and so if I look at it from my point of view, I think the time, there's no, there's, there's no better time than now to get started on some of this stuff, really. Um, I, and I say that in part because Alberta has just moved to uh, adopt EPIC across the province, if I understand. Um, and there are a number of large hospital systems in, uh, in Ontario that are adopting EPIC at various points along the way. Um, and so I, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background around this. So, for example, uh, EPIC has actually has developed an endoscopy reporting system, which they call Lumens, which was implemented initially with... Uh, uh, in Alberta. So that was probably one of the first places in the world where they adopted it. Dan Sadowski and the team there have worked on it. Uh, we heard about it. We're going to adopt it for Hamilton Health Sciences. I talked to Peter Rossos at UHN or Unity, and they are looking at a similar system and other systems as well. And the reason I talk about this is that you, you mentioned healthcare info or Canada info way. Peter Rossos with the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology probably about eight or 10 years ago developed a standard reporting system for endoscopy with standard terminology that could be adopted platform independent. And we could never get the leverage to get any of the vendors to take it on board. With Epic coming on board, we actually talked and, and, and I linked up Peter Rossos and, and Dan Sadowski in Alberta and we talked to other people, Ala Rostam in Ottawa, and basically got agreement that we should readopt that model. And, and the interesting thing is that it actually takes a huge amount to, there's huge inertia to adopting that. Even when we talk to Epic, mm -hmm. they go, yeah, we'll think about it. And we say, well, can we talk to the other guys? They go, well, let's hold off for the moment because we want to see how it works with the American model. And what we need to do as a healthcare system is say, there are data to be collected. We're all collecting the same data. We should be collected in the same way so that it's interoperable so that it can be moved around. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to do it from the start and that we beat up probation and Meditech and everybody else at the start. But if you have the major players adopt it, then it becomes the de facto standard for collecting data and sharing it across rather than doing major negotiations after the fact about changing things. And so the, there, is, there is an opportunity to do it. And the adoption of this means that you can actually start to collect data, but it needs sort of political will because there is there's, there's sort of buffer zones all of the way up to, to, to the payers and to Epic and to everybody else as we go along. And one of the interesting things about it, one of the measures of quality in colonoscopy is the post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer rate, which is developed or was, was sort of uh, quantified in the UK. And the notion is that if you have a colonoscopy, then uh, there's almost certainly a miss rate and there's a difference between endoscopy units. So if you measure the number of colon cancers that developed after a negative colonoscopy, you can actually work out the quality of the colonoscopy at the start because you, you can infer that from the number of cancers that develop over the next three years. Right. Now, they, they went back through their data. What they have to do is to go into their data and set timelines around this so that they have to, as it were, re reverse engineer the data. But in fact... If we sent, if, if, there was, if there was a central repository where every color screening colonoscopy was flagged at the outset, then any data that came in afterwards would automatically give us the post-colonoscopy cancer rate without having to make assumptions about what the time frame was at the start, where you assume that it might or might not have been missed, or whether it was different biology or whether something else happened. What you got is you got your clear data at the start. The data that are recorded, the data that could be recorded in a standard fashion, but what it needs is a system that says, we need those data. The system should record it. No negotiation about you know, what the back end does or anything else. Those data need to be done. And, and this is a time to do it because we're moving, many hospitals are moving to big electronic health records. And, and you know, even if you can't do it across the system, there should be leverage, particularly coming out of COVID where we need to understand how things are going to, to say, that this should be a non-negotiable part of data collection done in a way that makes it easy to collect. That was my rant, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, uh, they're not rants, it's, uh, they're, they're amazing statements. Kevin, have you got, would you like to weigh in on this conversation? You know, we don't, uh, aren't in the position of having access to EPIC, but I do think that the data 
Um, when you had asked two, our, two of our key priorities right now would be models of care and data analytics. And I think they do work synergistically. So it's, uh, as we work on the models of care, we're trying to inform that with uh, data and design our, um, you know, structure with data so that we can uh, better evaluate that going forward and trying to move into, Tim, into getting a little bit more interest in the health services research too, from our uh, clinician perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tim, your, your, your thoughts on uh, Fred and David's comments? Yeah, I, I, I would just echo what's already been said. And I, I think having that data um, up front and, and in an interoperable way, um, really, uh, it makes sense and it's so important. Okay, thank you. I, um, so before I leave this conversation is, uh, I go back to the point that I think um, many have asked is, We've really been chatting about this for a long time. I don't mean within this group, but the, the issues of, of data, data management. Um, I would agree with you, uh, Fred, having seen a lot of patient research, patients are very open to sharing their data. They're already doing it with uh, their phones every single day, even though maybe they may not realize it. Blockchain is gonna change some of these things, et cetera, et cetera. So where is, you know, what are those, step one, step two, step three, coming to a place where, uh, especially as we move into a more resilient healthcare system, what are the starting places? Uh, David, you said it had to be uh, done at a uh, political level. Is there a role for industry here? Is there uh, a role for different collaborative models uh, around this? Have we seen any learnings from many international countries where they've been more consolidated about their data strategies? So, I mean, the UK has actually set up a national endoscopic database, um, which is to inform quality improvement in endoscopy, and it's across endoscopy. Uh, and what they did was they, I mean, they, they got a very organized group there, um, but they went to, um, the software providers, so they basically developed an electronic health record and went to a number of providers and said, these are the requirements for an endoscopy record. And if you want to play in our space, then you have to deliver these. We don't care how you program them. We don't care if you want to add bells and whistles. You can do what you want. We're not restricting you, but you have to provide these data. And then they have to be in a format that can be exported so that we can then aggregate the data anonymously, but we can look at trends across the country and we can use that then for um, accrediting endoscopy units for colorectal cancer screening that we can use it for providing feedback to endoscopists regarding their performance. Um, and that, so that, that's a combination of political will from specialty, specialty groups, from okay. the National Health Service, from industry who are at the table, but were not allowed to dictate back to the healthcare system what they felt they could do. And, and what we had in Canada was basically big companies and we've, you know, we've had meetings with them over the last 15, 20 years and they come in and they go, well, yeah, but if we do a standard model, then you're taking away our competitive advantage over our other people and our ability to modify our system. And, and basically what we're doing is taking away their ability to charge extra for things that we don't really want. So mm -hmm. it's a combination of IT, political will, providers, um, and the healthcare system that says th this, this, this is non-negotiable. If we're collecting data, why do we collect it in a way that's non, non interoperable? I mean, that, that, that really just doesn't make sense. And, and waiting for a time for this to become realistic, you know, to easier is not going to happen. There, there is no commercial company that wants to make it easy. So yeah, you it, 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 I, I would suggest that that's, um, um a barrier as well change, evolution, uh, finding a way for these private public sector partnerships to be more robust, to be more easier, I think is part of what needs to happen here. There's lots written about this subject as well. So, so the, you know, people like Matt Rutter and John Anderson, Roland Bellori in the UK, working with the Royal Colleges, the surgeons and the, uh, the, the, uh, the gastroenterologists, uh, and the NHS basically sort of set up a framework for how they want to be able to collect the data. That's not across everything in healthcare, but it means you pick an area where there's something that right. needs to be monitored 
and set up a, a, a modus operandi. Perfect, thank you. I'd like to, we spent a lot of this conversation talking about screening and I'm sorry. Uh, yes. no, no. And I'm very happy we have, I think it's, uh, especially with this group, but I wanted to bridge a little bit into uh, treatment and the impacts that this group has seen, understood on the treatment of particularly colorectal cancer patients. Um, the first group that we had uh, as part of uh, Ready for the Next Round was with eight really quite amazing patients. It was at least half of them changed, adapted um, in consultation with their physicians, um, their treatment due to COVID. Um, is there data that you can share on this, Tim? Is there an understanding of the extent to which this happened? Um, and what's your general views on uh, the impact of these changes of treatment? What have we actually learned out of some of those things? Yeah, so uh, uh, un unfortunately, like changes in diagnosis of cancer, the, the treatment data also lags behind. Um, I, I, it'll be interesting to hear from uh, from other provinces, uh, you know, what, what their experiences are. <clears throat> but I think we're only starting to now understand what, what has happened with, with um, treatment changes. I mean, certainly, again, anecdotally, there have been changes, um, you know, for example, in, in radiation, the, the use of a shorter number of treatments, what we call fractions, um, in order to reduce the exposure to um, the, the healthcare setting. And, and that's, you know, th thinking about other cancers, not just um, colorectal cancer. Uh, I, I think in some cases, uh, at minimum, with uh, more advanced cases presenting, you just naturally will see combinations of treatments instead of just, say, a single modality treatment, for example, um, in, for colon cancer, just a surgery as opposed to surgery uh, plus, plus chemotherapy. Um, I, I think that um, thinking of systemic therapy, that I think the pandemic I, I observed in Ontario um, created a lot more openness in um, uh, physician judgment about what, what would be an, an appropriate extrapolation beyond the available data, um, g given the, the pressures placed on the system uh, by the pandemic and the challenges in uh, minimizing the number of treatments to the cancer center. So for example, considering oral drugs, as opposed right. to IV drugs that would require multiple visits to the cancer center, or considering um, preoperative systemic therapy where that might not have been uh, done so frequently. So I, I think that there was, um, at least in Ontario, a bit more regulatory um, flexibility and, and, and willingness to consider options that might not have been done in the past among uh, clinicians. Um, but it'll be interesting to, um, to me measure what actually happened. And uh, a colleague of mine, Tony Iskander, that I collaborate with is um, actively involved in this. And I, and I hope in the coming months, we'll be able to see uh, the, the changes in treatment, but, but outcomes again will take time. It will take years um, to know exactly what, you know, the changes in survival have occurred. Um, and um, I, I think it's, that it's the kind of thing we can't model because mm -hmm. the changes are just so unpredictable and I think so variable between regions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kevin, um, thoughts on that uh, particular uh, issues around treatment. What have you seen? Impacts? Uh, well, I would just echo, I think, a lot of what uh, Tim mentioned. I think the, the real emphasis was trying to reduce uh, the number of people coming into the clinic, to our clinics. And so as a result of that, some of those uh, different uh, treatment mm -hmm. options were definitely considered. Um, mm -hmm. I, the one piece, for the most part, I know there were times um, there was thoughts that we would deviate from what we had previously had been approved through the, say, a national process or something like that. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, um, I think we were managed to stay within the, the guidelines, but still have the flexibility that uh, Tim mentioned to provide to clinicians uh, in the situations that they had. So mm -hmm. the data side, um, you know, 
we really look trying to uh, tease that out, but uh, we haven't been able to uh, get to that real uh, sort of outcome as far as the impact on stages and things like that at this point yet either. But. Okay. okay. Um, David, as a, as a physician, any thoughts you'd like to add? Um, I don't really have a lot to add to this okay. at the moment. I mean, I, I think the, I mean, there's certainly been delay in cancer surgery. And I think, you know, one of the, really just one of the challenges is how to adapt to changing circumstances. Um, and, um, you know, with all of the chaos that goes around COVID, it then becomes a major additional challenge to work out how to be flexible with other treatment approaches or treatment modalities. And, and so part of this is, part of this is actually empowering people to, to, to be flexible. It, it reminds me of, you know, um, what was it, was it Mike Ryan at the start of the WHO sort of presentation on the COVID epidemic said, you know, never let perfection stand in the way of the good and never be afraid to be wrong. Um, you know, you have to make a decision and you have to go forwards. Sitting and thinking about it for the perfect response is actually the worst thing to do. So it's this balance. I th yeah. So that, that's my only commentary. Yeah, but no, no. the thing around that, again, comes back to being able to collect data and to know what actually happened. Um, and, and that requires an infrastructure in place and planning ahead of time so that we can see what happens. You know, our, our bodies don't, our bodies all operate on, on feedback loops. Um, and, and we need to do that with the healthcare system. We need the data to be able to know how to pivot or how to, how to move and respond to changes. Yeah, and yet that data does not seem to be forthcoming anytime yeah. soon. That's the challenge, I guess. Yeah. It's like driving blind. Great. <laughs> right, and how long can you drive blind for? Well, not, not very far. <laughs> right, right, before you go off the road, right? I, I, I'm going to um, I kind of level set the conversation a bit because we've been in a number of different places together. So what I'd like to do is just go around the table is um, what is uh, from your own personal perspective, the one thing, key thing that you feel the health system has learned from the pandemic that can drive future change? One thing that you feel that uh, you personally have learned that can drive health care system change into the future. Kevin, thank you for going first. I, and it uh, may not be as relevant to some of the things, but I think the potential for virtual care has uh, mm. something that uh, you know we pivoted to very quickly and uh, has been uh, you know really made uh, an op provided opportunity to look at how we've done do how we move to change things and what we would go back to or how going forward we make keep some elements of that. So I think that's had a, a real impact on practice already. Thank you. Great one. We'll have some conversation around that. Uh, Tim, would you like to go next? I know we've been talking about it a lot, but um, I'll, I'll say it. I mean, I think we, we learned the value of learning health systems because in many cases we really didn't have it. And, and so I, I, I hope that that will change that in terms of our, uh, our, our access to uh, functional systems. Okay. Fred? Um, I know it's I, hard, one yeah, thing, right? Yeah, it's hard to pick one thing, but I, and, and I, so I think it may be something that we haven't fully learned yet, but we're probably going to learn it in the fourth wave of the, of the pandemic definitively, is that no matter, you know, how advanced uh, we think our systems are or how much money we spend, um, uh, the, the staff uh, that we depend upon, uh, I mean, that doesn't change. And they have a breaking point. And um, all of those other things, you know, uh, do not allow us to push past that. And we're, you know, I uh, live in Alberta and uh, think people know what our province is going through at the moment. Um, uh, the health system has already collapsed in many respects, in, in my view. Um, if, you, if you're willing to measure it by more than 
the immediate response to, to dealing with COVID-19. Um, so um, people, people, people have a breaking point. Yeah. David, you look very thoughtful. I, I'm, I'm running out of ideas. So, I mean, I, I was going to, the virtual care, I think is, is an important part. It's, you know, it's one of those things that has been bubbling under the surface for years and it took a push of, uh, of a sort of catastrophic change to flip people's attitude. And a lot of the stuff that people had talked about, about privacy and everything else really just had to be dealt with. It should not have been discussed. Um, I think the other two points are, are clear. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I've learned. I mean, I think, I think and maybe people did realize, but is what a tightrope the healthcare system was working on, uh, that, that it, it was, it's sort of teetering on the edge of running into trouble. And, and it got by, and that's partly what Fred said, it got by by personnel because individual agents within the system would adapt or just make it work. And, and if you overstress that, then Actually, what we've got is a system that is really, a lot of the time, not really functional, but is held in place. And so what we should learn from it is that we need almost to do preemptive disaster planning or some contingency planning for the future. So it's not just about getting through to the end of the year. It's about... Our current model is... If we do this and this, we're pretty sure we might get by. And what we need to do is say, if this doesn't work, how wrong is it going to get? And how can we mitigate that? Or how can we ensure against it? So I think what we should learn is that we've got to do a better job of planning. Yeah, I want to build on that just briefly because there actually has been quite a bit of literature about the fact that because of SARS, as an example, there was a lot of what I call crisis planning information available to the system. And there's very mixed views on how well we stepped up around that, depending on who you speak, speak to. So I think there's already some templates that exist in the market for us to be able to use. Fred? I don't, yeah, I, I wouldn't consider myself to be an expert on this. I guess if I was thinking about it from a policy level, um, we didn't what we didn't apply um, in in terms of uh, what was learned from SARS is we didn't build the infrastructure we already knew we needed uh, mm -hmm. to handle a you know to handle a public health crisis uh, like COVID nineteen. So I, I leave it to other experts on the panel to talk about you know methodologies and and approaches uh, to management. But you know from a, a policy uh, system point of view. Uh, we didn't heed the warnings that were <laughs> that were clear. We didn't move beyond the pilot project. We didn't leverage um, the expertise to build a, to build a public health system that was was stronger. Right. I think that's a really great bridge into the final part of this conversation, which is if we could essentially restructure, um, build an ideal system. Uh, what might that look like? Um, we're, um, we had invited Pamela Froelich, as I mentioned, to, to this meeting. She very much wanted to attend. Um, and so much so that uh, Barry Stein from Colorectal Cancer did a separate interview with her. And there's some segments of that interview that we thought would be interesting for you to hear. Pam, as you know, is the uh, CEO of Innovative Medicines Canada, the representation uh, of all of the pharmaceutical uh, companies in this country. And so, Maria, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, please, to play that snippet of, um, of uh, the interview with Barry. Resilient healthcare system look like to you from the industry perspective in the next 10 years to come? I love that question. And it gives me the opportunity to focus in on what is commonly known as patient centricity. 
Although I would say quickly thereafter, you know, what do we really mean by that phrase? Um, how do we ensure it's embedded in everything we do? How do we make sure that in another 10 years, we're no longer having to ask those same questions? So that ability to really integrate the patient perspective into everything we do, not give it lip service, to me is, is a driver for um, how I see the health system resiliency growing in the next 10 years. And I have a little wish list here. I won't go through it all, but if you'll allow me to mention um, uh, maybe three or four quickly, uh, you'll give us, uh, get a sense, I guess, of where I'm going with this. So first and foremost, for patient centricity would be that patients have uh, access to medicines in the same timeline as other comparable countries do. Seems like a simple wish, but it's tough in this country. Uh, we're currently 18th out of the top 20 OECD countries. So we can do better there for sure. Maybe not even in 10 years, maybe in two or three, but let's put it within that 10 year uh, timeframe. Uh, secondly, and uh, we talked a bit about data. So uh, patient health records being digitized and having patient access already happening in other countries, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, I think is moving in that direction as well. So why can't we have 100% of Canadian patients digitized with their records and having access to them? Uh, we haven't talked a lot, and I don't hear it as much, but average life expectancy is a typical metric. And so we're, we're 15th at the moment. So can't we be top 10 in life expectancy? It's Canada after all. Uh, and another one would be around just the, we've talked throughout this chat about you know high performing health systems. There was quite a, uh, a difficult report out of the Commonwealth Fund just recently, a few weeks back, that put us at 10th of 11 peer countries. So can we move ourselves up? I know that one's a tricky one, but at least move up a, a, few, uh, a few places. So I have others, but I will stop there. And I, I think if we were to accomplish those fairly concrete but doable things over the next five to 10 years, uh, that would build a, a tremendous amount of resiliency into our health system. And it will, um, the, the more we focus on on getting access to the innovative drugs as quickly as possible. That keeps people healthy. It keeps them out of the health system. It leaves more resources to deal with the sorts of emergencies that we're dealing with right now. So it just makes sense. Well, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Do, uh, ha have any of you met him in, uh, in, your, uh, in your work? I haven't, no. Yeah, Fred. I've known I've known Pamela for for a long time. Great, great. So maybe Fred, I will give you the the first response to that. She talked about the concept of patient centricity, which, which of course has been um, in many ways uh, like the data conversation is uh, patients as an end user. Um, in business terms uh, of the system, evolving what that means, defining what that means, redesigning, redesigning the system, systems from a patient perspective. What could that look like? Where do we start? Well, I, I mean, hopefully we're not starting from scratch in Canada. I don't think we are. And I think, you know, groups like, uh, uh, like Colorectal Cancer Canada have, you know, provided a lot of leadership in not, it, it, it's, more, it's more than asking patients uh, to complete uh, satisfaction surveys about their experience in the health system. Um, and so we use, you know, we use some of these terms in, interchangeably, patient centricity, mm -hmm. uh, patient engagement. I know I've talked to Pamela in the past and, and, and her organization has been involved in the development of what are called patient reported outcome measures. Yes, and also patient reported experience measures. Um, the PROMs, the first one, um, are you know widely used in in value based healthcare approaches. Uh, so, in addition to the you know the clinical outcomes and and the others that you would normally expect to see, there um, there is a place for outcome measures defined by patients. Um, some of them, you know, the ones I've been exposed to, some of them can be quite surprising because they will funk a, a focus more on, um, uh, you know, a, a quality of life perspective, That's right? Yeah. Right. Uh, and that might involve, you know, uh, less than the top possible clinical outcome that that could be expected for a particular uh, condition. So simplistic example might be, you know, 90 year old gentleman who has the option of having, you know, uh, hip surgery. 
um, but tells the doctor, well, what's uh, asks about the recovery period and, and, and the risk and says, well, what I really want to do is be at my, you know, granddaughter's wedding <laughs> three months from now. I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but that's a very good there, example, actually. There's room for that. So if you make those patient reported outcome measures part of the equation uh, in how you're measuring success, it, you know, it, it, it can change. Uh, I think it can change things. Uh, significantly, but um, there's a it's it's a harder question as to how you uh, you know quote institutionalize those uh, in the same in the same way that we do other other types of um, uh, quantifiable outcomes. Uh, but yeah, and it, yeah, I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah, no. The only other thing I was going to say was, um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't change the need for more access. Uh, better access for patients closer to home, uh, you know, as, as at the sort of lowest level of configuration in the, in the delivery of care, which is the, the front door, right, which is primary health care. Um, so people ask for that a lot. In fact, in Alberta, you know, the highest per capita spender on an age adjusted basis for as long as I've been in health care. Uh, you know, the common line you hear from people when you ask them about their experience with, say, cancer treatment or uh, heart surgery or whatever the case may be is, well, the, the, the care was excellent. I can't say enough about how great it was once I got in the door or the problem was, was getting in the door or back to the navigator point uh, that we talked about uh, earlier, finding, finding my way through the system. So uh, these things don't have to involve more money. They, they involve careful listening uh, to patients uh, as opposed to the system talking at patients. And then, you know, perhaps reconfiguring um, the organization of, uh, of, of a lot of the care uh, so that we meet people where they are, right? Which yeah. is uh, in their community or on their iPhone or wherever the, <laughs> wherever the case may be, so. I'm very glad you brought that up, Fred. The, the concept of care outside of the hospital, we haven't gotten into the conversation about what I call ancillary services, whether it's mental health, um, uh, dietetic counseling, et cetera, et cetera, those services that support somebody outside of the system. So I do wanna come back to that in general, care outside of the hospital. Um, Kevin, do you wanna re respond to some of the comments that Pam made? particularly the ones around access to medicine? Uh, sure. First, I mean, I think patients, I mean, are obviously central. And, you know, we, mm -hmm. for example, have a, patient, a very active patient and family advisory committee. So we engage them in all activities, strategic planning, um, whether or board activity, whatever, to make sure that there's an mm -hmm. opportunity for input. Um, I do. Th it also leads, I think, to some of the equity questions we talked yeah. about when we look at how do we, you know, provide culturally appropriate care, um, and also to Fred's point, those, um, you know, building in along the continuum uh, as you have opportunity to have uh, engaged those difficult conversations or open those conversations so that uh, patients get access to what's the most appropriate for them. Um, on the access front, as far as uh, I think we, uh, you know, have national processes that um, we have in place and uh, a lot of those we look to hoping to see them work uh, to continually improve and then uh, there's always opportunity to improve or increase access to around clinical trials, which is a really important uh, aspect for uh, therapy within cancer care. Yeah. Any initial thoughts on how that could happen in, a, in an evolved, more resilient system? On the clinical trial front? On I the think clinical there's, trial front. Yeah, I, well, I think there's interest in having more, uh, you know, national types of approaches, potentially. And I think, uh, you know, there is uh, in improving through some of the organizations that support that. So there are discussions, but I think uh, generally Canada overall, as my understanding, has opportunity to improve um, from a national perspective, and that in turn would open up opportunities from more regional perspectives too. Yeah, thank you. So Tim, 100% of Canadians on digital health records, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, um, um, 
uh, thinking back to the point about improving access to clinical trials um, with uh, with people on a uh, interoperable digital record and having access to it themselves, as well as all of their clinicians and carers, um, you could think of um, various ways that that would uh, open up uh, access to clinical trials, um, so that anyone, you know, if your if your genomics is linked into all of your demographic and clinical data. It's all there in one place and, and you have algorithms in place to flag patients so that um, when someone has uh, uh, an overall condition and they're, or they're at their point in, in care where they need to be on something different that they can have access. So um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point. Um, you know, thinking about the concept of um, patient centeredness, I, you know, I, thinking back to the point Fred made a, a while back about the the staff and that our our human capacity um, in healthcare can only be pushed up pushed up to a point and you know not all aspects of of, of high quality patient centered care take more time um, but but some some do and I, I think that time aspect is is important um, to um, to allow space for it does it does take time to um, get to know your, your patient and, and to um, understand them so that you're offering tailored recommendations, not in terms of just their, their, you know, their genomics, but also in terms of their values and, and, uh, and desires and personal preferences for how they would like to be uh, interacted with and cared for. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, David, would you suggest that uh, a world where the patient voice is louder than it is today, where time is allowed for uh, greater conversation, is it possible in an already overcapacity system? As long as, they don't asking, shout at, yeah, yeah, I know. As, as long as they don't shout at me, I'm all right with that. That's <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, so I'm actually just looking at the quality improvement tool for endoscopy, because I've got to talk to Dan Sadowski in, in half an hour. And, and that, that was developing an approach to quality that was patient-centered. So it was from a patient perspective, what's important to the patient, not what's important to the hospital or to the physician or the endoscopist. And, and they're important for delivery, but it needs to be framed from a patient point of view. And I think, you know, um, the, the worry always is that um, you know the patients may be too demanding and they want too much of the system, but some of that comes back to communication and setting and aligning agendas, and to, that that's not done by taking one party out of the conversation. So I, I think it absolutely has to be, and 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 you know to some extent, or to a large extent, I mean the patients. We are the patients. We pay for our healthcare, and and so to, to a large extent, we should be able to define what it is that we expect. If we can't pay for it, then we've got to decide what we want, but we shouldn't be paying and then taking what somebody else decides we're going to get, which, which is, um, if we're not careful, is what the current system is. So I think we, we need to do that to work out and we need to be able to communicate. I mean, some of the, some of the challenges, one of the issues that's come out of COVID is, is a complete breakdown in communication with significant chunks of the population who, who really just don't understand. I mean, the, the, the notion is that they're willfully misunderstanding or stupid or whatever, but th there's a, it, it's more than that. We, we need to be able to set up communication so that people trust that the system and healthcare providers actually have their interests at heart rather than the underlying suspicion that we're out to get them. And so that, yeah. that's, that's going to be a really important part of this. That goes back a little bit to the commentary about access to medicines, which is important. But the other one is access to healthy lifestyles or life, um, you know, to, to healthy lifestyles or lifestyle adjustments that can play a role. And, and yes, medications are important, but in my area, you know, for example, a lot of IBS-like stuff, reflux disease, various other things, fatty liver, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, a lot of this is gonna be lifestyle related and we can fill people out with drugs, but actually what we need to do is to work with patients and understand why they have the lifestyles that they do and what we can do to work with them. So I think yeah. that 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 comes back to the patient-centered part of this. 
And that's key to understanding how we get people to decide whether or not they're going to come to colorectal cancer screening or cervical screening or whatever else, because sometimes they actually have other priorities. So I think I think they're really important elements that she made. I think the you know, access to medicines is perhaps a little self-serving. Going up the rankings is in whatever you want to do with OECD or whatever, I think is it's nice. It's, it's, it's nice to be able to pat yourself on the back. I think we probably need to deconstruct and say, what are the important things that we need to address for our population to improve their health and show that we're improving their care so that we can work with them as we go forwards. And again, to some extent, you know, international indices are, are either self-serving or are not particularly useful other than bragging rights. So, you know, the, the, many years ago, we, we had a, medical staff had a discussion with, with our CEO and, 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 and board and somebody, our medical staff association president said, well, as, as physicians, we want to be the best hospital in Ontario or in Canada. Um, and my, my response to that actually was, I'm not sure I want to be the best, but I certainly would like to do a bit better tomorrow than I did today. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's, it's to put a framework in place that does that. And that's, so that's working with patients to determine what their expectations are, what it is that they need and how we're going to be able to communicate that. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly that concept has been pre COVID the idea of having a patient experience director, it's had different terminology yeah. in different hospitals was, was starting to, uh, take, take, um, take form, although I, I fear in many of the data says that they were kind of the person you went to to complain to, as opposed to the person who is actually driving proactive gathering of useful information that can help to reframe the services that were being provided. Um, I want to just bridge for a second. Uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left and we'll wrap it up is, um, the, the, the concept of prevention and self-care, certainly a global trend towards wellness uh, following the pandemic. You see this in a lot of um, European countries in general. Uh, prevention and self-care, having worked in healthcare myself for many, many years is a tough sell. Um, my medicine will fix me. I don't have to do a whole bunch um, to prevent. Um, so, and yet so much new literature has come out around the need for health education, health literacy, taking steps towards healthy active lives, healthy aging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So outside of the system, all of this language is now starting to hit the scene on the management of wellness, the management of prevention. Um, what are you seeing from your perspectives in that world? if at all. Is there data, Tim, that shows the value of prevention? Oh, boy. Well, I think there, there's a lot of data within um, oncology about the, the importance of, um, of healthy living and, and that impact on cancer incidence. But, but in terms of um, uh, moving the needle and, and having more buy-in, I, I think it is hard. I mean, um, I know there's been a, a lot of conversation about building in healthy lifestyle into our, our communities. Uh, so it's not, it's not just a decision, but it just, just becomes part of how you um, interact with your community. For example, mm -hmm. I live in Kingston and it's a very walkable city. Um, there are bike lanes everywhere. It's a lot easier to make that decision to, um, to not drive from one place to another. And, and the city itself makes our family ask constantly, do we really need that second car? Um, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I think that, you know, that that's one um, important movement as we're engineering our, our living spaces to make um, he healthy decisions easier. Um, but, but in terms of um, behavior change, um, and that, that I, I don't have a lot of experience with, and I, but I, I do agree that it's, it's hard not to crack. Yeah. Other thoughts? Okay, I, uh, I'm going to um, uh, go around the table and uh, again, in the spirit of wrapping this up in a timely fashion, I know you have other things to get onto is that 
if um, if you could uh, direct, and I'm going to suggest that something that can happen in the next 12 months or so, um, a, uh, a, a change within the healthcare system, whatever that might be, that you think can create resiliency and send us on a better path towards a stronger system, what would that one thing be? Okay. Fred is smiling, so would you wow. like to go first? And then you get to go home. No, you're just, I smile when the wood is burning. <laughs> Uh, nothing's I can coming see to mind. The smoke <laughs> coming out. Yeah. It's. Um, I mean, I. I have to go back to the health human resources um, question myself, and um, I. I don't know if there's one, one strategy, but we're going to have to find a way to give, um, people um, reason to continue, to make the sacrifices they do to work in healthcare, and and I don't care whether you're a regulated health professional or. You know whether you work in an in an unregulated role. Um, I think COVID has really um, caused a lot of people to to question. It. I don't think it's as much the workload because I think we see we see tremendous sacrifice all the time on the part on on the part of people that work in healthcare. But um, for for frontline staff to understand that um, you know the the country is behind them. It's it's more about it's more than the sort of demonstrative gestures of, of support that we saw through the pandemic. I'm sure those were appreciated, but what value do we really place on the work that our health professionals are doing? How much are we willing to invest in their um, education, in their health and well-being, um, uh, in, in, the, in those sorts of things uh, at the same time as we're investing in new technology and um, you know, bringing, uh, making new types of therapies available to patients. I think that's going to be a big question for a lot of people. Unfortunately, we're going to lose some because they're just, they're just too close, or they might be in a position where they can choose to step back uh, and retire or do something different. And, and we won't have time to prove that to them. But we've really got to think about um, all of the all of the others, and most importantly, the next generation of, uh, of healthcare uh, providers in the country. Yeah, thank you so much. I, again, to build on what you've said is uh, uh, our oncologist yesterday said that the impact on the younger generation of medical professionals was dramatic and um, they were concerned themselves. Kevin, you had your hand up. I'll ask you to go next. Sure, and I think, uh, I mean, that's, uh, Fred's raised uh, really pretty fundamental piece of it. We don't have a system without the, the people in the system. So that's really important. Um, in the short term, I think the opportunity, we have some population-based uh, screening programs, but uh, the opportunity for multidisciplinary um, rapid diagnosis or early diagnosis uh, um, teams, centers or something, approach to that would be, uh, I think something that uh, would be of real value in the, in, the next year. Thank you. Great idea. Tim, may I go to you? Sure. Um, yeah, I think what Fred's saying really resonates with me. Um, and, and I and I think part, part of that is is creating diversity in, in people's positions. I, I think we, are, we all are working hard, and I don't think we're afraid about that. But um, what we do uh, with our skills and working, you know, at the, the top end of, of our skill set and and uh, having variety in our work and 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 really allowing parts of our work that haven't flourished to flourish. Uh, research, um, uh, outstanding teaching, um, expanding uh, high quality care and quality improvement. Um, I, I think that I, I would just uh, kind of just uh, add and echo some of the things Fred said. Um, I, I think I'm 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 going to uh, have to say something about data, um, <laughs> but, Please. but um, uh, I, if I, I'm trying to think of some sort of practical, measurable goal, um, because it's you know we've talked enough about general things about learning health systems. Um, maybe maybe perhaps saying 
um, that um, we, we in the, the short term are able to conduct, um, um, say, uh, another, you know, half a dozen uh, clinical trials in Canada that um, involve um, bringing in um, uh, federated um, interoperable data from across Canada um, in, in order to um, practically um, use, um, use our, our data sources and, and move forward learning health systems in a practical way. Thank you. I think that's a pretty great one. And, and David, last word goes to you. <laughs> oh dear, um, I'm not, okay. Um, I, mean, I, th I, I think the points that have been brought up are, uh, are absolutely excellent. I mean, and the, the challenge always with something this complicated is knowing where to go. Um, in all honesty, I think, you know, the, the steps have to be, they have to be transformative. Otherwise they're gonna be band-aids that are, that are, don't, actually result in any long-term change so you know we, the, the, there's a limit to the number of times you can say to people well we're behind you or we're going to clap when or, or whatever and, and at some point they turn off so i think I, I would endorse all of the others i think what i'd probably add into that if there's a way to do it and i think one of the challenges for healthcare is the central organization and i and all the central top-down direction of the way that things happen and I recognize that's important um, that the challenge and, and it's always a balance between central direction and local autonomy but I think there's a big danger that top-down central direction deprives frontline workers of agency when they're actually doing things and and we need to appreciate them and we need to keep them there but many have gone into healthcare because they want to do something, they want to achieve something. They didn't go in to be pen pushers or to record data or various other things. They can accept that that's part of a job if the data come back to them. And so this is really about empowering people under appropriate direction to make incremental changes or to improve the way that they do things. And you know, I would say from experience that proposals to change the way that things are done in hospitals, for example, are exercises in frustration that will often take two, three, four, five years and then die. Um, I, I started a home parental nutrition program 25 years ago and said, we need to get funding. And I have had 360 degree studies and reviews and various other things every three years for the last 25 years. And we haven't changed. I've been told that I need to be a little more invested in maintaining the home PN program and that we'll get back to it. Um, and and I, I'm not saying that from my point of view, what I'm saying is that we need to be able to allow people to make changes and to get reward out of their jobs. And that's a really difficult thing to do because it involves top level management or high, high quality management to let people do things and keep an eye on them so that they go, they, they work well, but to allow them to get the, the payback. And I think that reward from the system is something that we need to work out how to reintroduce. Um, nursing, I think, has almost been demolished by running by yes. guidelines and by running by rote and, and working within practice. And it's destroyed the profession almost, I, I'm being a, a bit hyperbolic, but it, it's made it very difficult within a profession um, to actually deliver what people thought they were doing when they went into the profession. Yeah, you see this in many professions. I happen to work in the pharmacy industry for many years and uh, certainly frontline pharmacists with their measured on versus their desire to provide patient care. Those are oftentimes two different things. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I think that mm -hmm. that's something that we need, it really needs to do because the system operates. Systems look, big systems look at positions. They say we have a position to fill. And actually what they have is they've lost somebody who had skill and capability that may actually be close to irreplaceable, certainly in the short term. And to be replaced requires that that, pace, that person grow into their job and learn how that job works. And that's what keeps the system going. And that's why when people decide that they're going to walk away, the system crumbles because you haven't just lost a position, you've lost skill and investment, which we need to maintain. 
Beautifully stated. Thank you so much, David. I, um, what's been really interesting for me, having the privilege of moderating these groups is that uh, people have, you know, everybody's talking about virtual care and access to medicine and all those things are critically important, but the general theme of all of these groups is human resource management, making it right for the professionals who are there is a top priority as, as uh, the system evolves. I wanna thank you so much for your very fine contribution, your exceptional contribution, as a matter of fact, for your time today on behalf of colorectal cancer. If there's something that you still wanna say and feel that we didn't cover, uh, Maria, who is in contact with you uh, to invite you to these sessions, you've got her email. We're happy to hear from you behind the scenes to be continued. Um, thank you so much again for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. It's a pleasure to see everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Likewise. Yeah. See ya. Night. Mm.